Okay. So I'm excited for Jillian to present to us. She is the manager of the community benefits and health improvement at Sharp Healthcare. She's also the chair of the Hospital Association uh, Community Health Needs and Assessment Committee in both San Diego and Imperial County. And I'm excited to hear what she has to share with us tonight. Jillian, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this will go well. All right, can folks see everything? Look good? Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, first, first of all, thank you all so much for, for having me um, this evening. It's, it's truly an honor. I've just um, had the great pleasure of beginning to work with Amy and learn um, all about the great work that you've been doing for quite some time. Um, seems like we're a little bit late to the conversation, but we're just very humbled to, to be a part of it and hopefully this is just the beginning of those conversations. Um, so what I'd like to do this evening is to just provide um, a high level overview of Sharp's process for identifying community health needs and then discuss a little bit of how that guides our process of um, developing programs that respond to those needs. Um, and those programs we, we call community benefits. So they're two different processes, but they're very much intertwined. Um, and again, it's through the needs assessment work that um, we started to gain an awareness of the issue of human trafficking, particularly in healthcare, but also just within the community. Um, and as we begin our latest season of needs assessment development, which I'll talk a little bit more about towards the end, um, we're really excited to just learn more from the community and learn how we can be um, of best support and really be proactive in, in helping to um, address this need, particularly as it, it influences healthcare and our, our patients in our community at large. So with the next slide, let's see, how do I, oh, there we go, apologies. Um, so we'll start with community benefits. So this is something that SHARP has been participating for quite some time. It's actually based on state required legislation that mandates all California not-for-profit not hospitals um, share the details on their activities, programs, and services that they provide to address identified community health needs as well as the financial value of those activities. And we'll talk a little bit more about our process for getting that financial value um, as well. We report this activity within a framework of four different categories, which we'll detail later, but in general, they are medical care services, benefits for our more, more vulnerable populations, benefits for the broader community, and health research education and training programs. We provided our first report in 1990. Six, and the legislation was actually in 1994. So it's interesting because this has really become a national model for hospitals that with the passing of the Affordable Care Act um, are really kind of new to looking at how to identify community health needs and also how to respond to them. So the way that we identify those health needs is through something called our Community Health Needs Assessment or our, our CHNA. It's something that we conduct every three years. It actually also started as part of that same community benefit legislation. Um, and we have been participating in this process since 1995. From 1995 till about the passing of the Affordable Care Act, um, SHARP participated with a number of other hospitals as well as community-based organizations to develop one county-wide needs assessment. And it was facilitated by an external group. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, um, Community Health Improvement Partners, CHIP. At the time, they were brought together specifically for this purpose. And we engaged in that process up until the passing of the Affordable Care Act because that legislation changed things quite a bit for us. Um, the legislation now requires for each individually licensed hospital facility to have their own needs assessment, as well as their own implementation strategy. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. So what that meant for SHARP was a shift from just participating in this one countywide collaborative needs assessment 
to still doing that and actually being much more involved in, in the process, um, but then using that collaborative countywide needs assessment as a foundation to build our individual hospital needs assessments. So SHARP does six of these. Um, two of our hospitals, Sharpberry Birch and SHARP Memorial actually share a license. And since this is a license-based regulation, um, we're able to conduct one needs assessment that combines the two of them. And even though, you know, at first, this was obviously quite a bit more work, um, this really resonated with both leadership and teams across SHARP because um, we have, you know, we have a hospital in East County, we have a hospital in South Bay. And even though we do see um, similarities in terms of the overall needs that are identified in the different regions, the way they impact those regions and the way they impact specific communities, even within those regions, can be quite unique. And so this new legislation actually allowed us to really tailor our needs assessment processes, particularly to the communities that we specifically serve at SHARP. Another big change was we went with um, having CHIP really be the facilitator of those countywide needs assessments to now working under the auspices of the Hospital Association of San Diego and Imperial Counties. Um, we also, for, for our first few needs assessments, um, our most recent being back in 2019, we also collaborated with the Institute for Public Health at San Diego State University. And they really serve to do our, um, our countywide data analyses as well as facilitate our community engagement across the county. We have a needs assessment advisory committee that's comprised of all the hospitals that you see here um, on the slide. Uh, in 2019, Scripps Health was the chair. They were also the, the chair for 2013 to 2016. Sharp was the vice chair. Um, but you can see that these are really the major competitors here um, in San Diego County. And, and one thing I can tell you, especially because we meet so often, um, our committee meets um, at least twice a month, um, but typically more frequently. And we found that this space is really, um, it, there's really no competition at all. We, we all have the same goals in trying to do right by our community, particularly those communities that face inequities. Um, and so this has become a really powerful space for hospitals that are typically very competitive to collaborate and to, to find common ground. So we have been very mindful over the years of our needs assessment process. Because we do these every three years, because we are identifying major health needs, you know, obesity, chronic health conditions, behavioral health, we know clearly these are going to be needs that are not resolved every three years, right? And so we have been very mindful in our processes such that we respect the, the time of those partners that we engage. Um, we ensure that we are not recreating the wheel. We are trying to thoughtfully build off of our previous findings, build off of what we've learned so that the questions, even though we might be trying to dive deeper into the same topic, we are coming at, coming at the topic from a different angle, from a more meaningful angle, because we're taking the things that we've learned in the past and really trying to create more of a living, breathing document, you know, not something that just sits on a shelf and is, is pulled off every three years and submitted for, um, for meeting federal regulations. So that was one of our big goals for 2019. Again, in the ways that we looked at doing that, of course, were to ensure that we capitalize on those partnerships that we have developed over the years. So really looking to our partners to help guide um, gaps that we may have missed, to help us navigate to different partners that may, we may want to engage. We actually have a whole robust secondary process that happens after we submit the final report, we have something called a phase two process, which is us actively going back out to our community and our community partners, sharing with them the findings of the recently completed needs assessment, and then proactively asking for their feedback on things that we may have missed, what we got right, what we should continue to build upon, other people we should work with, etc. So this is something that's really become baked into the cake of how we develop our needs assessment every three years. Um, and that's pretty much the phase that we're at right now as we are planning our 2022 needs assessment. We also look at data, as you could imagine, we look at quite a bit of quantitative data and this includes um, at both the county level and the SHARP specific level. We're looking at hospital inpatient and ED data. 
Um, we're looking at clinical data. We're looking at community health statistics provided by the county, um, any kind of social determinant of health data, so socioeconomic data, um, behavioral data, um, so perhaps data from the California Health Interview Survey. Um, we we've really built up a robust um, quantitative data set. And then, of course, community input. And, and this has really become, I think, for us, the most significant piece of our needs assessment process. Um, we can learn quite a bit from the data, but you know, as I'm sure many of you know, data can mean very little without community stories, community perspectives, and insight to actually provide some real meaning to them, to, to color them. You know, we know that sometimes quantitative data can be misleading if we don't have input and voice from the community to help us really discern it clearly. And from there, we prioritize needs. We use the typical criteria um, that, have, that are used in research studies to, to prioritize these types of needs. So we're looking at severity of need, we're looking at um, scale and magnitude. We are looking at trends over time. Um, and then also any health disparities or the needs that we identify impact, impact in a particular community, especially a more vulnerable community differently than others compared, um, compared to different needs. From there, we prioritize, and then our last step is to publicly report. So if you're interested in the collaborative needs assessment, there is a very public link on the, the HASDIC website, the Hospital Association website, and I'm happy to share any of these links directly with Amy after, um, after the presentation if folks are interested. SHARP also, as I mentioned, we have six different needs assessments. They are all publicly available on SHARP.com. Um, they are very long, so they, they, on average, they're running around 400 pages, um, but that's including a wealth of data um, as appendices. Happily, there are also executive summaries available, so um, if you're looking for something a little bit lighter. And then we also have publicly available our implementation strategies, and essentially what those are, they're really... Um, they're stripped down versions of the community benefit report. So it's just meant to be a, a much more simplified document, still fairly lengthy, um, but where we just clearly state the need we've identified in our needs assessment and then list the programs that we have developed to address those needs. But these are things, these implementation strategies are also updated on an annual basis. So we are required to report any changes in those programs, any metrics that have been met. Um, a lot of, you can imagine the implementation strategies will have a lot of information about COVID this year. So it's really, it's a nice way to get a handle on not only the needs that we've identified through the assessment, but also the programs that are put in place um, and really the timelines associated with those programs to help address the needs we've identified. So that community engagement, I did want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about this for our, our process in 2019. Um, you can see that there is similarity between the format of the collaborative countywide needs assessment under HASDIC and then SHARP specific needs assessments. For both, we conducted key informant interviews, we conducted focus groups, we conducted online surveys. Um, focus groups, we, this again, this this piece was really taken with a lot of guidance directly from the community from that phase two process when we completed the previous needs assessment. So we had much greater representation this time around um, from um, providers who serve our patients and community members who experience homelessness, um, from veterans, from LGBTQ, from students themselves. We actually had students who, um, children, youth who experience homelessness as part of these focus groups. We work closely with our community clinics because they really have their fingers on the pulse of, of different community members that are experiencing um, different hardships in the San Diego community. We worked closely with them. Um, for the surveys, we did an online survey that included a mix of community-based organizations and leaders, as well as even leaders in healthcare. And then for SHARP, this outreach, because we are doing such a wide reach across the county through the collaborative needs assessment, we really try to focus on um, specific communities and, and really patients and caregivers served by SHARP. So in terms of the focus groups, a lot of that was held with um, SHARP providers. So we had diabetes educators, cancer patient navigators, um, we had a focus group with attendees of an aftercare, so that's our substance use um, support group that's ongoing for folks even years after they have, they are still in recovery. 
Um, and then also we utilized a online community called the Sharp Insight Community for an online survey. And this is really focused again on um, Sharp patients, providers, caregivers, and then also a few just community members. Um, but we really tried to model this survey again, kind of on what we were sharing at the collaborative level. Through both of these efforts, the Collaborative Needs Assessment and SHARPS, we reached more than 1,000 individuals in 2019, and more than half of them were either patients or community residents. And that's, that's a big win for us. I mean, we've been, um, we've been increasing the number of, of members that we engage through our community engagement over the years, but this was something that it was really by leaps and bounds. Um, and truly this was um, undeniably due to the feedback that we received from our community partners and, and working with them to, to build on that trust and to hear more from the community. Another powerful tool that we have used over the years in our needs assessment is something called the Community Need Index. And I really wanted to share this with you. I think it could potentially be valuable. Um, so the Community Need Index or the CNI, it's a publicly available data tool that um, was developed by Dignity Health. Well, I think actually they're now Common Spirit, but formerly Dignity Health and Truven Data Health Analytics. And what it is, it's a, a tool that assigns a vulnerability score from a very low vulnerability to very high low vulnerability to every zip code in the United States. And this is based on, I believe it's a dozen metrics, but they fall into five different socioeconomic categories. So we're looking at income, housing, insurance, education, and language and cultural barriers. They combine these metrics and assign a score from one to five, as I said, for every zip code in the United States. It's free, it's publicly available, you could go to the website and look up your zip code now if you wanted to. And again, I'm happy to provide that link as well. Um, what we have done over the years is to create these maps. Um, so this you see is a map of San Diego County with the CNI data laid over it. So that's what the blue and the green is meant to convey. The areas that are that darker forest green, those are the areas of very high vulnerability. And then as you're getting towards that lighter blue, that powder blue, those are the areas of lower vulnerability. And you can see there's a significant amount of, of darker green on this map. We also have these maps, Sharp does, by region. So if you're interested particularly in seeing South Bay or East region, excuse me, we have those. I'm, I'm happy to make those available to anyone who's interested. In addition, what Sharp also did, you see the red dots on the map, we looked at inpatient data for behavioral health, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And we laid that over the CNI map. So the larger those red dots, those are the higher rates of discharge. Here we're looking at behavioral health. And then the smaller the dot, the lower the rate of discharge. It's a little bit more consistent across the county with behavioral health, which just reflects the, the challenge that behavioral health is. Um, throughout San Diego, throughout the state, throughout the country, this we know. Um, and then also, because we are only looking at SHARP data here, just to clarify, we're only looking at SHARP hospital data. Um, that's very likely why we don't see as much representation in, in Northern County. We don't, have, um, we don't have as strong a presence up there. However, even with behavioral health, you still can see many of those larger red dots are over those darker green areas. And when we look at diabetes or cardiovascular disease, it's even more striking. Um, so this has been a really powerful way for us to underscore the inextricable link between socioeconomic factors or what we term social determinants of health with health conditions and health outcomes and healthcare utilization. This has also become a very um, impactful tool for conversations with our public officials, um, SHARPS, VP of Government Relations uses these maps very frequently in those conversations to really demonstrate community need and how that's impacting health in that community. Um, and again, these the maps with the rates of discharge over them are also available at different regional levels. So I'm happy to provide those um, as well. So the findings. Um, so another, um, another big goal for us in 2019 with our needs assessment process was to look at what was happening across the country and to really better align our needs assessment process and the way we communicate our findings 
with national best practice. And when we looked across the national landscape, what we saw was that no longer were health systems separating out social factors, social determinants of health from your typical clinical health conditions when it came to health needs. Our first foray into this area was in 2016, where we actually did have our first documented list of social determinants of health as part of our findings, but it was a separate list. It was separate from health conditions. And what we learned, especially through community engagement this time around, was that it was nearly impossible to talk about any of these health conditions that were prioritized by the community without also talking about the social determinants of health that impact them. So for example, um, you know, talking with diabetes educators at Sharp, you could not talk with them about challenges of, of their patients meeting success in their health without also talking about, you know, the inability to adhere to a care plan because of lack of access to healthy food or lack of transportation to their appointments or um, lack of economic resources to afford their prescriptions or their medical equipment. It was just, just not possible anymore. And so what we decided was rather than have the two separate lists and also <laughs> what we also learned is that it's nearly impossible. We actually did try to request this um, to rank health conditions amidst social factors. Um, and so what you see here in this graphic is the complete list of our identified needs for the 2019 needs assessment. And they are not listed in rank order. They are strictly listed alphabetically. So at the top are access to healthcare. And this includes, um, this includes not just health insurance. We learned that a host of other challenges exist after people get their health insurance, whether that's transportation, whether that's access to specialty care or behavioral health care or dental care, um, understanding and navigating insurance. Um, community and social support. So this really came out in terms of conversations about the need for clinical community linkages. So a link between the clinical setting to community-based organizations that can help better assist with social needs. It also came out in discussions around senior health, which we'll get to with aging concerns and the issue of isolation among seniors. Economic security, so this includes basically anything tied to income. Um, so this will also include um, economic mobility, job mobility, um, job security, food insecurity or lack of access to healthy food, education. So this came about in, in a couple of different ways. So education itself as a social determinant, um, we, you know, we learned through looking at different data sets that Typically, education is a good indicator of that economic mobility, um, and often because of that, it's also a good indicator of access to health um, and adequate health resources. But also education in terms of career pipeline programs, as well as bringing culturally appropriate education beyond the walls of the hospital and out into the communities who need them. And then homelessness and housing instability. Obviously, this is something that has just increased over recent years as a need both in San Diego and throughout our country, and especially California. Unintentional injury and violence. And this was where we did hear mention of human trafficking. Um, we heard this at the collaborative level in select discussions. And then also with, um, with our patient family advisory council at SHARP, we had a facilitated discussion, and this particular advisory council is based in East County, so this concern was really coming particularly out of that region, but this was really the first time that we started to hear multiple citations of human trafficking um, as a need to be addressed and a major concern. Getting into the clinical, um, the more clinical health conditions, so aging concerns, so this includes Alzheimer's, but also um, physical concerns of our senior population, as well as caregivers, behavioral health that includes substance use, cancer, chronic conditions. Really here we're talking about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity as the main chronic health conditions people mentioned. And then for sharp maternal and prenatal care, including high-risk pregnancy. And the reason this graphic is in a circle, I mean, we do have the lists distinguished just so we can show social determinants versus health conditions. But the reason they're in this circular graphic is it's really intended to reflect the interactive nature between the two, right? How they really do impact one another. 
And in conversations with case management leadership and social workers at Sharp, we learned that oftentimes this exists as a cycle, right? Um, stigma, you see, is prominently displayed on both sides of the cycle. And that's because we heard a great deal about this as well in our community engagement. Um, stigma related to access to social programs. So things like even uh, Medi-Cal, but frequently also CalFresh or California's food stamps um, and how that stigma might prevent someone from accessing those programs and this in turn can have a negative impact on their health. Um, we also heard about stigmas particularly related to our undocumented community members and the fear that has existed there and was heightened um, during the time of this needs assessment. And then also even stigma related to other health conditions. We certainly heard about stigma connected to behavioral health, um, aging concerns, seniors, um, but even we heard feedback from, from patients about, you know, even if it was unintended, sometimes being made to feel like their diabetes is their fault, um, but it's, it's choices that they made and whether or not there is any, any role that behavior may have played in that, that stigma can often just put the wall up right away in terms of a provider patient conversation and, and is not helpful. So in addition, with all those findings, we also make sure that we request from our community ideas around resources and opportunities. And in particular, the feedback fell within these three categories that you see here. So first of all, strategies. A lot of these strategies were really around educational campaigns, um, particularly to enhance community knowledge, um, and also not only knowledge of health conditions and particularly chronic health conditions is what we heard about, but also the resources that are available to them, um, whether that's provided by the health system, the hospital system, um, or a community clinic or another social service organization. And then the other category of strategies was really about addressing the, the challenges and barriers to healthcare, so transportation, financial assistance, things like that. Feedback on resources, this, um, this included both on-site resources, so, um, so making urgent care clinics have longer hours, um, additional time that they are available, but also bringing resources out into the community. So mobile clinics specifically had been mentioned. And then of course, um, we also heard a lot of feedback in the, the category of policy change. And a lot of this was around, again, easing access to healthcare as well as um, the economic burden. And this was actually even before COVID, but really lots of discussion about affordable healthcare um, and even a, a minimum wage as well. And then the one thing that these categories really all had in common um, that we heard consistently from the community was that health, these strategies and resources are not necessarily um, in the wheelhouse of health systems in particular, right? So in order to be able to move the needle on these and really start having productive conversations about these opportunities, we have to collaborate with the community-based organizations that do have those expertise. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm humbled and, and excited to say that um, though we have a long way to go, there's always more work to do, of course. Um, but we've made some great strides here. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those programs as we get into the community benefit section. Um, but Sharp in particular um, has really strengthened, either developed new innovative partnerships or strengthened existing partnerships so that we are more comprehensively addressing our patients as, as a whole person. So really also looking at social determinants of health and how we can be at the very least a better connector for our patients to those resources. So now we'll move into community benefit. <laughs> um, and you can see here, this is our, our process wheel. And, and at the heart of it all is Sharp Healthcare's mission. And, and that mission is to improve the health of those we serve with a commitment to excellence in all that we do. But you can see that very closely aligned with that is the community health needs assessment for that particular entity. Um, from there, we look at the particular service area or the essentially the main community served by the hospital, the expertise of that hospital. So for example, Sharp Mesa Vista is a behavioral health hospital. We're really gonna focus on behavioral health programs for them, right? And then as well as any unique community characteristics of the region or the age groups of um, patients that we're serving there. From there, working with community benefit leaders and this, this has grown to include service line leaders, um, actual executive leadership, 
From there, we identify the community needs to be addressed. We determine the activities um, that we're going to implement and we establish measurable objectives associated with those activities. As we develop the report, we review the year that has just passed so that we can detail those activities. And this often incurs, um, includes figures such as the number of people served, um, the amount of time invested by SHARP staff, that is a, a key component. Um, and then also any outcomes, you know, any, any, whether that's clinically related or just community stories, feedback, we're hearing directly from the community on how these programs affected them positively, we hope. Um, so we then report on those previous activities. We also then move into the financial valuation phase. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we look at the actual numbers for community benefit. But suffice to say, this includes the, the costs of uncompensated medical care, but then also the labor and benefit costs that are associated with the time that is invested in other typically non-medical community benefit activities. So we report on that after we've quantified and um, categorized those activities by financial value. That community benefit report is submitted to executive leadership for review. We then um, submit it to the state and we actually just submitted our fiscal year 2020 community benefit report uh, last Friday. So it's hot off the press, the numbers that we'll be sharing today. Um, we then distribute it, we implement those activities and then that cycle just continues. Um, and I can tell you, it really just does not end. We're already, um, we just submitted the FY 2020 Community Benefit Planning Report, and we are already working on the um, FY 21. It's really, it goes hand in hand with the needs assessment, right? These, these processes and these programs are their most impactful when they just evolve in real time. And we found that both of these, both of these processes have become a living, breathing, um, document and that has just made them even more powerful for not just for our patients and our community but actually also for SHARP itself because we're able to see the value in real time of these programs and help us to make decisions around um, whether the direction of a program needs to change or if it needs further support or further resources and it better engages our leadership in the process as well. So looking at those numbers, in fiscal year 2020, SHARP provided more than $463 million in community benefit. Um, this translates to about one out of every $9 of SHARP's net revenue being provided in direct support of the community. It also comes out to about a little over a million dollars a day as well. Um, so this, this chart, you can see the numbers are, are in thousands. Um, and so clearly the, the most significant category there is the unreimbursed medical care services. It's about 98% this year of our community benefit. And this is typical. I think the percentage has, has ranged from 96 to 98% um, because of the impact of COVID on community, typical community benefit activities that are non-medical. Um, clearly we've seen a bigger sway towards the medical um, care services category this past year. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but what this includes is our charity care, our um, shortfalls in Medi-Cal, in Medicare, in indigent programs and other government programs as well. So essentially it's, it's the difference between the services rendered and the costs received, um, whether that was zero or some type of reimbursement from the government. Other benefits for vulnerable populations. So these are really our programs for our seniors, um, for our disabled, for our patients and community members who face other socioeconomic hardships. Um, we'll look at some examples of that. Benefits for the broader community. This includes our um, more broader community education. So for any age, um, this includes health screenings, flu shots, support groups, um, any time on boards and committees out in the community. So Amy's time counts, which is lovely. Thank you, Amy. Um, and then also, we also have a number of career pipeline programs as well um, that fall in this category. So any, any student that's under college age. And then health research, education and training. Um, this is our, our, essentially our intern programs. The majority of them are nurses, 
Many are pharmacists, but this includes um, all of the support that we provide for interns, including supervision and administrative support. This also includes our um, any speaking engagements at colleges and universities. SHARP actually has a semester long program at San Diego State that's all SHARP leaders speaking throughout the, um, the semester. And this also includes a research component. Um, so we have an outcomes research institute that shares best practices with the broader community. And that's the piece that's the community benefit. You know, anything that's really kept internal, we view it as truly, you know, benefiting SHARP. But it's when it's shared with the broader community at no cost um, that it becomes a community benefit. Um, and then the other thing related to that, I'll talk a little bit more about, but that's our, our um, continuing medical education program as well, our CME program. So for our other benefits for vulnerable populations, um, this was around 3 million this past year. We did see a dip in some of these programs, again, um, because of COVID specifically. You know, anything that was provided in person, so any of the education and support groups that were pro provided through our senior resource center and our senior health centers, um, after some time, if it was possible, we were able to transition them to virtual formats and that was great, but clearly that did take some time, right? So we did see a little bit of a dip there. Um, this also includes our transportation for patients. This is a major piece of this category. Our project health, um, our project health program provides financial assistance mostly around transportation um, and prescription assistance. All of our hospitals have this program. Any of our support for community clinics, and then collaborations that we have, I sort of hinted at this earlier, that we have developed specifically to help address social determinant of health hardship in our patients um, who tend to be more vulnerable. Um, we've got, we've had some exciting partnerships um, with 211 and the Community Information Exchange, um, some that have been around for several years and we continue to see very exciting outcomes from. Um, that's kind of a whole separate presentation. If you're interested in any of those programs, I'd be happy to to follow up with you. Um, but the way that we collect um, the financial value for these programs, so for the non-medical, the medical, um, unreimbursed medical care services category, that typically comes straight from finance. Um, however, for our other benefits for vulnerable populations, the broader community and health research, education and training, we're really relying on SHARP team members to report that time. And we actually have a, a robust process with our HR department where we collect their time through an online reporting tool that's internal to SHARP. And then we provide this information to HR so that they can conduct a completely confidential anonymous process to financially value that time. Um, and we are very, we're, we're very stringent about it. Um, you will, sometimes you will hear, you know, about some programs that are being categorized as community benefit when really it kind of sounds like more of a marketing um, event. We're very careful to, to not do that. We are very mindful of community benefit guidelines and, and the federal guidance around that. Um, and so we look at all of those entries and we get thousands of entries. Um, for fiscal year 2020, we counted 66,000 hours of community benefit time that was devoted by SHARP team members. And that is significantly less than typical years, again, because of COVID, because so many of our programs had to get canceled before they could be made virtual. Um, so just to give you a sense of the process of, evaluate, of, of, of valuing that labor and benefit, um, it is through a, a report in process um, that we do a lot of work around to encourage folks to report. So again, our benefits for the broader community, we talked a bit about this. Um, this photo you see here is actually from a baby and me time support group that's provided through Mary Birch. It's actually um, this young woman, Lindsay, she actually shared her story with us about how the support group um, really helped to, um, to keep her going through some difficult times after, after her pregnancy. And, and that's a story we'll actually be sharing through our executive summary document that we will be distributing throughout the community in summer it will come out. If you're interested in receiving that, we'll have it on um, an electronic version as well, but we will have plenty of hard copies to distribute. So um, again, feel free to reach out to Amy if you'd like one of those for your own. And then health research, education, and training, as I mentioned. Um, for those internships, those figures that you see there um, is typically almost twice that. Um, 
for the students and the hours that we are able to collect. Um, and also the financial value associated with that. Again, we just saw a stall in a lot of what we could offer um, students this year because of the impact of COVID. Um, but I do want to pause here, actually, because I've, I've said a lot of what we weren't able to do because of COVID, um, but we actually did a tremendous amount um, to help further support our community um, in light of COVID as well. So I mentioned that we transitioned a lot of our programs to virtual formats. This included support groups. Um, and in fact, Sharp Mary Birch took on all of the maternal and prenatal care support groups um, from the other hospitals that provide this service. So from Sharp Chula Vista and Grossmont um, and made this widely available to the community through the virtual um, format. And actually Lindsay's story includes that as well. Um, in addition, Sharp team members across the system did extensive outreach to patients, particularly those that were um, cardiac patients, patients at our senior health centers and senior resource centers, our diabetes educators, really just going above and beyond and, and making courtesy calls and reaching out to patients to let them know, you know, to answer any questions they might have, ease any fears, especially if they had a particular question about their care plan, if they weren't able to get into um, to see their physician because of COVID. Um, and then also, of course, we were involved in a lot of countywide collaboratives um, to, to help discuss as a healthcare system and with other systems in San Diego, how to best prepare and continue addressing um, the crises that were emerging as a result of COVID. So very actively involved in that level as well. And then lastly, the thing I wanted to mention here with um, continuing medical education, because this is something that's been very exciting for us. Um, we have been working with them, um, our CME team, to develop curriculum that includes needs that have been identified through our community health needs assessment. Um, our first experience with this was about three years ago with food insecurity that was actually identified as the number one identified health need for social determinants in our needs assessment. This is when we had the two separate lists. Um, and working with CME, we developed an entire system-wide curriculum that first started out just to be um, really focused on educating physicians, but with interest um, and as we got greater feedback from the SHARP community, we opened up that training to social workers, to case managers, to nurses, um, to pharmacists. And as a result of that training, um, there is pretty much across the board food insecurity screening at our hospitals, as well as our medical groups. In addition, that education led to some other innovations by our medical groups to um, be more proactive in connecting patients to resources for food insecurity. Sharp Steely has a really tremendous texting program now, really directly related to that education. Um, so it's a really powerful reminder of sometimes how education really is what is needed to get the ball rolling um, and to really bring to the forefront things that just might not be part of typical physician education. Um, since that time, we have had, we have ongoing discussions with CME. They also, um, they also did a curriculum around Alzheimer's as well as a few, um, a few programs around stigma. So they did one around stigma of obesity. Um, and I know that especially since the last year that they are more closely examining the intersection of um, health equity and social determinants of health. Um, and then also um, hopefully human trafficking as well is gonna be part of that curriculum, which is really exciting. So it's really, it's a, it was an important step. Um, and actually that program, that CME Food Insecurity Initiative is going to be published in um, a public health textbook, I believe in this coming spring. I'm happy to get that information, but if you're interested in learning more about what that program entailed and the outcomes associated with it, um, I'd be happy to share that with you as well. So lastly, I, I just wanted to finish up by um, kind of coming full circle back to the needs assessment because I mentioned um, one, that we're in our 2022 planning process and two, that the process never really stopped from the end of 2019. Um, so we recognized, of course, that this is a very unique year to reach out to the community um, to talk about the needs that they, that they have observed. Um, our 2022 needs assessment 
will be the phase, the first phase of it. So the, the document that gets submitted to, um, to the state and is publicly available um, will be completed in September, 2022. However, um, 2020 was a pretty devastating year for everyone in San Diego. Um, and we know that, again, trying to be mindful of not recreating the wheel, but most certainly being sensitive to our community members and to our community partners who have been, you know, just overwhelmed with trying to meet the needs of the community during this very difficult time, um, rather than doing facilitated discussions, um, rather than doing focus groups, we have decided um, with their input, with their direction, um, that it makes more sense to just listen. So again, building off of those community relationships that we have strengthened, going back to our community partners and essentially asking their permission if it's okay to sit in on a meeting and really just take good notes um, and really hear what's happening in real time. Um, because since COVID, community needs have been evolving, you know, weekly. Um, for those of you that are involved in you know, community organizations and you have ongoing meetings, I can just think of a few that I'm involved in. And you know, it, was, it was a week by week and sometimes day by day um, process and plan. And so we, for this time around, we're really going to focus on health and social needs, but also better incorporate um, the lens of equity. That's also what we are continuing to hear from folks and um, to better shed light on health disparities that are that really COVID kind of pulled the curtain back on as well. In addition, we are going to be um, creating regional work groups, again, kind of to, to get at what I mentioned before, to really assess how um, different regions and different communities within those regions have been uniquely impacted by, um, by health needs and by, um, by the hardships over the past year. And, you know, I don't want to sound so negative, but also what's been working. There was actually some really tremendous community um, response with COVID and community organizations coming together to develop programs, again, in the moment to help meet community need. And so again, we want to be able to ensure that we have adequate representation and we're really hearing from key leaders throughout those regions so that we can be well aware, not only of just the ongoing needs, but also anything emergent that might be uniquely impacting that community. And then lastly, um, we have a goal of providing more frequent updates to the board of directors at the hospital association. Um, since we are going to be very soon hearing from our community, again, in that real time, the needs that they are observing uh, from the impact of COVID as well as any other emerging trends. We want to be able to share that early on with our HASDIC board so that we can better engage them and also, you know, to better engage, um, to better leverage the role of the hospital association as an advocate on these issues. Because um, that's really a natural fit as an advocacy organization for them, for us. And so that is all I have. I apologize. I think I went a little, I went very long. I am so sorry. Um, but I hope it was I hope it was interesting. I, I welcome any questions. Again, I, I really hope this is just the beginning of us talking with each other and collaborating and hearing from you um, how we can be a better support. So thank you. Thanks, Jillian. Um, if you have a question for Jillian, please unmute yourself. If you haven't um, filled out the attendance form, please see the chat window and fill out the attendance form. Um, but she's given us a good picture of how that nonprofit status means that we need to be engaged with the community and, and addressing those needs. Um, and so sometimes what you can do, like for me, I wasn't aware that Sharp had this uh, human trafficking in their needs assessment. Um, but the, the time that I've spent was reported and, and that supported the goals that the Sharp has. Um, do you have any questions or comments for Jillian? Hi, Jillian. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned in the presentation um, about the 
um, like the surveys that you guys provide every three years. Um, I was, I tried looking it up online, but I was having trouble finding um, the link. Would you mind sending that either Absolutely. in the chat or to Amy? Thank you. You mean the, on, the online surveys that were part of the community engagement? Yes. Yeah, I can definitely yeah. send that. Yeah, all of the resources that you sent would be really helpful. Or yeah, that, that you absolutely. And we did have a presentation on the CIE Community Information oh, Exchange, cool. Good. but it's been it's been at least a year. So okay, but that's a really um, great resource. We're very excited to to be a part of it. Um, and I, I think it would be really helpful. I actually, Amy, I was on a webinar yesterday through UCSD on human trafficking. Um, I think it was their series and it was their final in a series. And they mentioned a number of organizations um, that could be a potential resource for individuals who may be trafficked. And so um, I was going to have a conversation with CIE about you know, looking to engage those organizations, make sure they're in CIE as referral resources. Yeah. Um, but if you have any other ideas and if any other members of the committee you know, think there are resources that should be available for referral, um, I'd be happy to pass that on to the folks at CIE. Great. That's a great first step in better connecting people. Yeah, no, I think that's wonderful. Hey, James, we put the link to the thank you note in the chat box. Yeah, happy to. Awesome. Thanks. Um, any other questions, comments for Jillian? Yeah, CIE, what is that? Um, it's a listing, Jillian, you probably can answer yeah. that better. It's the community information exchange. So it's essentially, it's a, it's a platform that includes, um, community member data. They agree to participate in it and it, it basically documents their social need history. So resources that they've accessed in the community, including like the food bank, um, Father Joe's housing resources, um, a bunch of food resources. It's it's basically facilitated by two one one, but it's truly kind of a community um, a community owned program. Um, and essentially, what the way Sharp is has been utilizing it. We actually just became an official partner in twenty nineteen. We are participating in a pilot with them where it's allowing us to refer patients to community organizations that are on CIE through a direct referral, through online referral. So it serves a few different purposes. What it can do is provide patient or client history. So if you're working with a client and you know trying to learn about their social needs, different resources that they've accessed, um, it really just helps provide a better story. We found it's particularly valuable for our patients who experience homelessness because um, they are typically quite transient. Um, but then in addition, the other major benefit is that it allows not only for you to document social needs for your clients, but also to be a part of a care team where you can directly refer them to an organization and there's a closed loop to that referral. So if I want to refer a patient to the food bank through the direct referral process, which is just an online click, they, the food bank receives basically a tickle and they have to respond electronically. And then I would get a notification seeing, oh, okay, food bank is going to reach out to my patient. And then the food bank calls the patient so that the onus is not on your client or your patient in front of you. It's, um, it's really just moving towards that more holistic patient-centered care, um, client-centered care uh, through sharing data and through sharing social needs data. Yeah. And it's, it's really trauma-informed, too, because they don't have to rehash their story over and over exactly. again. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I'm happy to, I have a general, some general PowerPoints on that as well. I can share with the group if that would be helpful. That would be very helpful. Um, sure. And um, the, now with the CIA, one thing to keep in mind is the patient does have to consent and opt yes. in. Yes. Um, just because of HIPAA and stuff. And there's certain institutions where the information is siloed because of HIPAA and confidentiality. Um, so that's, it, we could maybe do an, another presentation on that. Might be time for a refresher. I'd say one of the things that we use it for as well and have had a little bit of um, struggle with is there is a notification process. So if it, it's someone who is consented into the CIE, all of that information is integrated with the county. 
And so you can see if a, um, if a patient was taken into the ER, you can see if they were like arrested and that type of thing. So that was one of the reasons we were interested because we um, sometimes lost track of some of our two second trimester abortion patients. And it was like very dangerous for them to not get that second day of care. Um, yeah. But the one limitation that we found, like you said, Amy, is that they have to be consented in. Yeah. And so there are lots of people who haven't been consented yeah. in yet. So it, it can be a struggle to find some patients if they haven't already yeah. been entered in. Right. And there's a, that's a challenge that we are experiencing as well. You know, we, we do a lot of education with our teams on how to have that conversation in a sensitive way for patients, you know, to ease any concerns. I do know that other clinics and organizations that have been much more successful are those that have actually just um, combined CIE enrollment with their own intake process. I don't know if we'll ever get there at Sharp, but I know some community clinics that have done that. Um, and they, I think, are really, you know, they're a huge part of that increase in, in number. I think there's like 163,000 maybe individuals in CIE now, um, potentially higher. But, uh, but there's 3 million people in San Diego, so that's small. And I know that like with a patient that's been trafficked, they're going to have trust issues and maybe aren't going to be willing to opt into that but but if they are then it it has a whole umbrella of services that address the other social determinants of health that that intersect with trafficking so um but we need to above all make sure that that patient's comfort and privacy is respected so so this is like an internal system base that you as practitioners or healthcare systems have access to, and you need to get the consent of the patient. So when yes. do they, when do they, when does the patient hear about this CIU? Is it at registra or registration? Is it at their intake or their appointment? Yeah, so other different organizations do it differently because social service organizations also use CAE, like as I mentioned, the food bank, um, community clinics. The way we have been using it at Sharp Healthcare um, is through a few different ways because we actually have it rolled out at our hospitals as well as our medical groups. And so um, for most of the hospitals, it's either the case manager or the social worker in the ED that they're typically um, working with these patients. Mm -hmm. We found that CIE enrollment seems to be more successful with observation patients because they tend to have, they tend to have more time with their patients for one. Mm -hmm. um, and then also typically their health conditions tend to be less acute. A lot of, a lot of the patients that our social workers see in the ED, they just want to get what they need right. and get out of there, you know, so that can be, that can be more challenging. Um, with our medical group, so we have one medical group that's been using it as just a part of their practice. Um, it's one Sharp Committee Medical Group in the South Bay, and they have been using it as just part of their intake. And I believe it's the nurse practitioner that maybe does that. Um, but then, for example, we also have with Sharp Steely, our population health case management social workers. They are doing a lot of the consenting over the phone because they already have kind of these processes for consenting patients over the phone for a host of other programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really kind of depends where it fits best. Um, you know, I'd be happy. Um, I have a, a workflow from San Isidro Health Centers that I'd be happy to share with you. They shared with me to kind of provide some insight into how they do it. Um, but it does happen differently at every organization. And I'd imagine, you know, at a social service organization, it would be even more different. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing if you're a social service or a direct service provider, mm -hmm. how you can register your company or your program for that, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. I can't see who's talking. I'm so sorry. So if you wouldn't, you know, Amy, maybe you could. <laughs> I'm, if you, yeah, I'm if, so embarrassed. I'll connect you with Denise. Um, that would be great because I'd love to connect you directly to the right person at CIE because they can give you a lot more detail on that piece. Okay, yeah. awesome. And and maybe we can connect if you could connect with us with them, then we could maybe mm -hmm. get a refresher. That'd Absolutely. Be because I think be, like so much of what you said really rings true with us because we understand how the social determinants of, tel of health both cause human trafficking and make it hard to exit. So those are really helpful. Um, yeah, absolutely. I can definitely do that. I just want to remind you guys to sign the attendance form and the thank you note. Are there any other questions, comments? 
Did we, um, I'm sorry, I'm not a healthcare uh, provider. So this uh, is a little difficult for me to kind of follow from A to Z, but did we, was there any mention of psychiatric assist, uh, like determinants or like what you're seeing? Cause I would, I mean, from a direct yeah. service provider in, in San Diego, working with youth and families that mm -hmm. identify and um, have experienced or are at risk of CSEC and human trafficking, we've seen such an increase in referrals for psychiatric yeah. needs and services like no other within this past mm -hmm. year. It's, it, it's incredible. Like, Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the findings we were just looking at as you know, they were from 2019. Um, but we as we have em, embarked on the 2022 process, I mean, we are hearing throughout the year, I mean, not just from community providers, but also even just internally at Sharp or Mesa Vista, our hospital, I mean, um, trauma and behavioral health, um, trauma and challenges and substance use, like everything has been yeah. exacerbated. Um, and that's something we've been hearing throughout the year. And, that, and we are actually looking, I think someone from the hospital association might actually be on this call. Um, so Stephanie, if you're there, please feel free to jump in. Um, but we're also looking particularly on how this impacts um, youth as well. We're hearing a lot about that. We're having some very um, specific conversations with folks around that. Um, but behavioral health, behavioral health in general has been a need we've identified since 1995, I think. Um, but again, you know, it's certainly, it has a, not only has it increased, but it has a, a totally different level of urgency this year. Mm -hmm. So is it kind of, is it more with like, if there is, if it's assessed and then there's a need for services, for psychiatric services, is, do you all just um, refer out to community partners? Is that the, or, um, the kind of referral process that you all use or you treat them like in-house in these healthcare systems or refer out? Are you talking about using like using CIE, using the community information exchange or just general process? Just general process. General process, we, we typically, I mean, Sharp Mesa Vista is one of the largest behavioral health providers in, in California. So we typically try to do our best to obviously work with patients in-house. Um, the challenge I'm sure you've heard is when it comes to lower levels of care, right? For folks who continue to need care, but maybe do not necessarily need to be inpatient. That's a challenge the county has experienced and, and seen heightened increased levels um, year to year. But typically, you know, we have, behavior, we have behavioral health patients. We have a behavioral health unit also at Sharp Grossmont Hospital. I think we have a small one at Chula Vista, but primarily we try to do our best um, to work with patients internally at Sharp. And then a lot of the times it's a challenge with looking at behavioral health resources in the community, right? Particularly for, to meet the need, the level of care that our patients require at that time. Um, the way we're using something like CIE is really for social need, um, not necessarily behavioral health. Okay. Yeah. Is that helpful? Did I yes. answer your question? Yes. yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions before we say goodnight? Jillian, I, I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you for listening to me talk so long. I did. No, it was great. <laughs> and and it helps to understand how, you know, that the community benefit hours address those social determinants of health and benefit the nonprofits. So it really everybody wins and the community is um, stronger for it. So, yeah. and I will say too, if I can just close with one quick comment, because Amy, you mentioned, you know, how you reported your time. You didn't realize that human trafficking was a need, but you reported your time in the community benefit report. And that's just one example of how we were able to connect. Yeah. You know, for us, you know, when we see something like that, if we see somebody report an activity that is, first of all, we had no idea that that work was, was happening, that you were doing that work. And so we were just blown away and saw that as our opportunity to, to get involved and find out how we can support in, in a need that is, you know, we as a hospital association committee, we need an education on. So. Right. And Jillian um, and, and her colleagues are going to come to the Human Trafficking Advisory Council and get more input because um, they want to be able to be more equipped to address that. And I just want to encourage all of you that, especially those that, that um, are employed by nonprofits, if you're doing 
volunteer work in the community, like I'm a foster youth mentor as well, that you're reporting those. And, and there's a, there, if you don't realize it, there is a benefit to your, your uh, nonprofit as well. So have those conversations with your leadership. So. Anything else before we say goodnight to Jillian? Okay, thank you so much again, Jillian. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate all of you and the work that you do. And I know there's a lot of information, but it is being recorded and I'll put it on our YouTube channel and we'll share it with everybody. Okay. okay. So thanks, thanks again. Please uh, sign the thank you note if you haven't already.